Sorry. Thank you very much, Judge Sinisi. We now pass on to our second presentation, Views from Europe. And the Judge Sinisi and the next speaker, Stefano D'Ambroso, uh, I know them, or they know me, mostly because of connections with my son. Uh, something has, happens in life when you're known through your son. Uh, both of them know me through my son. Our next speaker, who is going to speak on Justice Scalia's legacy from an Italian perspective, is also a native of Barry, or Bari. And he is presently a questore of the Chamber of Deputies, uh, that is, a, I guess, the equivalent we have here, Sergeant at Arms, uh, in the Italian uh, uh, Chamber, of, uh, Chamber of Deputies. Um, I'm not, we're not going to ask him what happened in the case of, a, was it a Cinque Stelle, who claimed to have been punched? But anyway, <clears throat> I guess that's part of the problem that you have, having that job as Questore. Uh, he has been for a long time a member of the judiciary, and he has served in very, what I would call, hot spots in Italy, Agrigento and Palermo, and of course, a breeder in Milan. Uh, he is well acquainted with the American system. He has visited the United States often, and uh, his previous appearance here on this campus was when we honored Judge Falcone. And uh, he certainly has had much experience in prosecuting and learning about not only that aspect of Italian criminality, but also the more current aspect of Italian public life, which is the jihadist and extremist threat. He has served in Vienna, in the um, United Nations International Atomic Energy Organization. and. Uh, Finally, in 2013, he became a deputy, a member of the Italian parliament. And uh, as, we, as we said, he is serving as member of parliament currently. And he has introduced or signed off to many pieces of legislation combating not only the mafia, but also extremism in Italy and throughout the world. Uh, I would like to introduce to you Deputato Dambro De Stefano D'Ambroso. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Let me say that uh, I feel a little bit uh, embarrassing because, uh, because of uh, this previous uh, very brilliant uh, presentation and uh, it's difficult for me for, with my English to be at the same level of uh, the previous speakers but I will try and uh, uh, I hope that uh, you will accept my presentation as a kind of uh, testimony of uh, the, Italian, uh, the Italian consideration which uh, we gave to the uh, work of Mr. Uh, Anthony Scalia. I had uh, a, ra a very rare, rare and uh, uh, was a really a privilege for me uh, to share with him one night uh, in uh, the house of uh, American ambassador in Rome on 2012, uh, 13. And uh, we share some consideration on uh, the uh, level of terrorism in Europe just uh, some months before the um, tremendous facts uh, which happened in Paris. And uh, we share, uh, he, I was really uh, interested uh, to feel how much he was uh, really 
involved in this uh, uh, battle which U.S. every day combat against this kind of risk and uh, danger, and uh, it convey to me uh, that uh, really uh, the U.S. intelligence, U.S. Uh, um, U.S. organization needs to feel that Europe, uh, United Europe, and not each country, but United Europe uh, is cooperating with the U.S. against this really difficult uh, situation. And let me thank all my friends, which think to me uh, for uh, another invitation. I had the privilege to be here four years ago with Mr. Grasso, for commemorating uh, another very big uh, international uh, uh, judge, Giovanni Falcone. And uh, I have the opportunity to keep a relation and a contact with uh, this fantastic organizer, which is Mario Mignone. And I hosted a very smart and brilliant group of uh, young students this year, last uh, summer, they hosted, they, they visit uh, the House of the, the Italian House of Parliament, and uh, for me it was a, a privilege to host them and to show uh, the beautiful place where <coughs> I have the opportunity and the privilege to work in this period of my life. But coming back to Mr. Anthony Scalia, the death of a constitutional judge, in this case a justice of the U.S. Supreme Court where appointments are for life is an event of considerable import given that the court has a, a powerful role in the public life of the USA. In my capacity as a member of the judi judiciary on loan to the world of politics, I am most honored to be able to speak today in memory of just, Justice Anthony Scalia, who was among the most prominent recent judges of the U.S. Supreme Court. As you will be aware, Justice Scalia was the first Italian-American to sit on the bench to the Supreme Court of the United States. And from the moment he took office, Scalia followed an entirely consistent conservative line and, often through his famous written dissenting opinions, argued against <coughs> any evolutionary interpretation of the Constitution, preferring an originalist doctrine that he himself developed based on the original textual meaning of the constitutional, constitutional provisions. His doctrine has had a major impact on American constitutionalism, and this morning I had some, something very interesting about the <coughs> environment of a constitutionalist in this country. And uh, its effects are not just legal and jurisprudential, but also cultural. Following in the footsteps of Alexander Hamilton, Scalia also favored a partial, balanced, and well-reasoned return of power from the states to the federal <coughs> government, while favoring the assertion of national power and a strong executive. His interpretive approach offered little latitude to progressive notion concerning abortion, gay rights, the bearing of arms, and the death penalty, all sensitive issues about which we can hardly assume that the American public's feelings have uh, <coughs> removed, remained unchanged over the centuries since 1787 uh, when the Constitution was passed. In the area of civil rights, meanwhile, Italy, Italy has recently approved a parliamentary act that permits civil unions between same-sex couples and regulates de facto relationships. The new legislation is far-reaching in its implication, also because it brings Italian law on this matter back into line with the debt of the other European countries. The One Act regulates two completely different types of cases, homosexual partnerships and heterosexual partnerships. With respect to homosexual partnerships, the Act introduces civil unions, which it 
partially assimilates to marriage by <laughs> setting out a series of rights and the duties, including the right to a survivor's pension, that means the transfer of pension payments to the surviving spouse, but not the right to adopt children. A civil union is authorized by a registrar in the presence of two witnesses, and it carries a mutual obligation to cohabitation and to moral and material assistance. For heterosexual couples, the act refers to the co cohabitation of two adults united by stable ties of affection who provide one another with a mutual moral and material assistance. It, it does not grant such couples the same rights of inheritance of a survivor's pension that they would enjoy in a marriage. The couple, however, may sign an agreement regulating a property relationships, which may include the community of a property. After years of debate, the legislation was able to pass largely thanks to the approach adopted by EU legislation and the case law and by the ruling of the Italian <laughs> Constitutional Court. As far the purchase and possession of weapons, which is another topic very sensitive for US and for European also, the legislation in Italy is highly restrictive. As a result of a phenomenon such as a sub subversive terrorism and organized crime, the law on possession and circulation of weapons have been tightened over the years. The right to bear arms is therefore restricted to the law enforcement and uh, some very <coughs> restrictive person who fulfill certain legal requirements and arrangements the best warranties the safety of the citizens. The law also provides for a periodic checks of registered gun owners. Scalia, <coughs> Scalia was convinced that the US Constitution had a static meaning that does not change from generation to generation, but is to be preserved and presented to the public at large <coughs> through an attentive and accurate reading of the text, informed by an awareness of its historical circumstances. He was, in short, a staunch conservative who felt it necessary to support and promote, sometimes in an highly combative style, an interpretation of the Constitution whereby the great divide separating originalists and the proponents of the current meaning was to be radically resolved in favor of an approach that respect the original intention of the founding fathers. The reform would eliminate the anachronistic equal division of powers <coughs> between the houses of thus eliminating the ping pong effect of bills continuously passing back and forth and return. I'm passing to speak about a very important reform which are trying to introduce in Italy. Italy today seems to be divided between those who are in favor of an amending constitution <coughs> through a reform bill that has already been approved by parliament and awaits popular sanction in the constitutional referendum of the next October, and those who oppose the reform. The proposed amendment will put an end to the perfected bicameralism of the Italian political system in the name of governability and would usher in a properly mature <coughs> democracy. The current model, which gives the two houses of parliament exactly equal legislative powers, was introduced, introduced immediately after the end of the fascist regime and at that time of the Cold War. It was justified by the majority parties on the grounds that Italy needed to counter the communist threat that might have drawn the country into the Soviet sphere. This reform would eliminate this anachronistic equal division of powers. <coughs> and uh, which this and uh, the Chamber of Deputies and the Senate which has been the cause of many delays and duplications in the past, should be eliminated. The complete parity of the two powers of the two houses, coupled with other political reasons, has been acting as a brake 
on their legislative productivity. Under the proposed reform, political action will be able to proceed with the necessary speed required by the demands of the economy. Supporters of the proposed reform claim that one of its benefits will be to reduce or contain the cost of political, political machinery of the state, since it proposes to reduce the number of deputies to 500 and the number of senators to 100. Right now we have 630 <coughs> deputies and 330 sen senators. We, are, we, are, we have 1,000 parliamentarians, which are a little bit too much. <laughs> <laughs> the Senate will have, in any case, full legislative powers only in matters of constitutional reform and constitutional laws. As regards ordinary bills, the Senate's powers will be limited to asking the Chamber of Deputies to make amendments. For legislation affecting the powers of the region and local authorities, on the other hand, the Senate will wield greater authority than the, the Chamber of Deputies, which, if it wishes to reject the Senate's proposal in this area, will need to master an absolute majority. Finally, the Senate will lose its power to pass a vote of confidence or not confidence in the government, which will become the exclusive prerogative of the Chamber of Deputies. Yet, some remain critical of this constitutional reform, which will soon be put to a referendum. Its opponents argue that it will not end the bicameral system, but simply make it more confusing and lead to conflicts or jurisdiction between the central government and the regions. But these are reasons which uh, my party and uh, the majority in this, in this moment, part of the parliament, doesn't agree and doesn't share. <clears throat> but to return to Justice Scalia and to end my, uh, my presentation, let me tell that he was regarded as a strict guardian of the Constitution and as a strong opponent of the idea of a living Constitution, but also an excellent judge. For this reason, it will not only go down in history, but will also continue to be part of the future of the United States and Italy as a shining example for future generations. Scalia was a man of the law who, like the prosecutor Falcone and Borsellino, was a credit to the Italian nation for his work, the force of his conviction, and his resolute defense of constitutional principles. For Scalia, it was up to the times to adjust themselves to the Constitution, rather than up to the Constitution to adjust itself to the times. Let me tell against, thank you very much for this invitation. For me, it's an honor to be here among a very high level of uh, colleagues which works in uh, this jurisdictional activity in the US. And thank you for the invitation. Thank you very much.